In today's lecture of our course we will talk about basic statistics and we already applied basic statistics in a certain sense and we will have a view here on another aspect of basic statistics. So the background for or the division of statistical analysis or fields of statistics can be done in multiple ways. One way is to um, talk about the output of different statistical methods and one possibility is to talk about descriptive statistics which is trying to summarize and describe different data using specific values that give information about these values of the variables in a more condensed form. For example, very basically, if you want to have an idea what the mean value of something is, you can calculate the mean uh, by summing all the individual values up and then dividing by the number of these values. And there are some other things that are not so commonly used in everyday life, like the standard deviation, that would deserve a specific treatment and also would be deserve to be handled within this course. Unfortunately, we don't have the time for that, so I decided that we'll skip this part of the lecture and we will yeah, not very much talk about this. Probably because, or partly because you know something very relevant for that already, that's the mean, and you probably know that from your daily activities. And partly because there are other things that are m probably more practical in the first place and much more difficult to understand outside of such a lecture. What we also, also already covered is graphical display, which is also some kind of descriptive statistics, not describing individual values or ranges of values by specific numbers, but describing them by visual representation of these. And here, for example, bar charts, pie charts or scatter plots are something that is used and we did that already in the last session, in the last two sessions. In the last session we talked a bit about a specific um, kind of explorative statistics which is using graphical visualization or also numerical um, description to get an information about patterns in statistical values. One thing here is the correspondence analysis which can be used to detect a pattern in nominal scaled variables. Others could also be, for example, regression analyses, where you try to identify if there is a relationship between one variable and the other. But there is a lot of overlap here. So, of course, explorative statistics use graphical um, representation quite often or numerical values. So this all blends into one part of um, statistics, which most of the time describe or give you an interpretation about the data that you ha have at hand, the data that you have measured, your measurement series, your values. The other kind of statistic is what is called statistical inference or statistical induction. And that's the part where you try to estimate or get a feeling about what the population, the underlying pattern is behind the values that you have actually measured. And a large part of that are statistical tests. And we will concentrate today on this part because there are some things uh, in statistical testing that are a bit counterintuitive and not too easy to understand. So I think it's more worth um, talking about that here in, in the framework of this theoretical lecture and um, help you to understand that while I think basic things about standard deviation you can figure out yourself or learn from other courses or other sources. So we will talk mainly about hypothesis testing, statistical inference here, the hard statistics, you can say. For that, we will have to lay a bit of the ground to be able to talk and understand that. And that's what we will do today. And in the end, I will introduce to you a statistical test that's very robust and easy to apply, even with LibreOffice Calc probably better with specific statistical software, but it works also in LibreOffice Calc. And actually it works also by using a pen, a paper and a calculator. So that's the beauty of this kind of test. And that's why I've chosen that. And you can already solve a lot of archaeological questions 
just having this specific test at hand. So not longer ado, we will just give a bit of uh, background to some statistical knowledge and then we will move or work our way towards this statistical test and how this is implemented. First thing that we have to know or to, to acknowledge is that there is a division between the population, all the values that are relevant for our investigation, and the sample, those values that we have actually measured and for those we have information. And most of the time these are two different things. Um, there are different reasons why this is the case. For example, you can think of the population as if there is a uh, voting going on in Switzerland. All the people that are able and allowed to vote, these are the population about which you want to have their opinion. It's probably not perfect English grammar, but I hope you get the point. All the people living in Switzerland that are allowed to vote for something are of interest when you want to forecast or actually get the result of a vote. But before the actual vote, if you are interested in a probable result, you will not have the possibility to ask all the citizens of Switzerland all the time, several times over several weeks, what their opinion is. So you have to select a certain amount of people that you ask that stand then for all the other people that you cannot ask. And the better your sample is selected, the better these people represent the actual population of Switzerland, the better will your forecast be. And the same is true for archaeological situations. Here, additionally, the difficulty is we don't have the population. We will never be able to get the population of objects or people in the past because most of them have decayed already. So um, due to preservation conditions, we never will have the possibility to get the full population of the past, except if one of you will invent the time machine in, in the near future. But beside this, po even then, it's not possible because you probably cannot visit all the Neolithic villages in Switzerland to get some information there. The message is, we all the time want to have an opinion and an estimation about some values of the population. Nearly all of the time, we, don't, we are not able to get this information. We only have limited amount of information. We only have limited numbers of samples which we use to have an idea what the total population would have looked like. Um, and especially in archaeology that is the case. So population is the one that we would like to know, sample is the amount of information that we have and there n need to be some kind of link between the sample and the population so that we can do some estimation or make a statement about the population giving our sample. Because there's always some kind of uncertainty attached to that, you will see that this uncertainty is also reflected in the way of how statistical tests work. The next thing that we need to know to have an idea about, for example, what kind of test we can apply is this levels of measurement. And we talked about that already in uh, the previous sections. So we have the nominal variables where you only have categories that are not have not a defined relationship among each other. Um, the only thing that you can do if you have a whole set of uh, objects with nominal uh, variables, you can count how many of them fall in one category or the other. And these need to be not need to be just two mutual exclusive categories. It can be multiple ones. Um, among one level of measurement, of course, they should be mutual exclusive. Um, but there are also other kind of statistical um, procedures where there can be an overlap. But that's nothing what we will talk about here. The next more information rich category or level of measurement is the ordinal level. And here we have again categories, but these categories have between them a defined relationship. So um, there is the possibility to order them or to define their rank within the whole area of the statistical value. 
for example we can have preservation conditions and we can say bad preserved medium preserved good preserved and with that we have already um, an arrow that gives us an information uh, about how we can order objects along this gradient of this variable so we can put all the bad preserved in one on one side all the good preserved on the other side and we know that the medium preserved would be long in between we don't know how much better preserved medium is in respect to bad we also don't know how much worse medium is in respect to good so there is no measure measurable distance between these variables but we can order them and that's what falls into ordinal categories and the last big thing is what is called metric variables here we have a defined system of measurements and we have a defined system of distances between these measurements when we have interval scaled variables we have an arbitrary chosen neutral point so zero degree celsius is arbitrary chosen temperature of uh, freezing water but beside that it's arbitrary chosen while uh, so we can have negative values here while with ratio scaled variables we have an uh, absolute neutral point uh, like in degree Kelvin there is no way of having something colder than uh, zero degree Kelvin so that's an absolute value and with that we have um, we can calculate the ratio hence the name between different um, objects so if something is 20 degree Kelvin it will be double as warm as 10 degree Kelvin which is not the case in respect to the underlying process the movement of atoms when we choose uh, to represent our values in an interval scaled variable like degree Kelvin sometimes there's also talk about absolute scale that accounts uh, but essentially this is another variant of the metric scale here so the big three are nominal, ordinal and metric and metric also can be subdivided in interval and ratio and different statistical tests different statistical methods require variables in a specific level of measurement here and I've shown you this uh, visualization also before nominal scale we can only count with ordinal scale we can count and order with interval scaled we can of course order but we can also define distances between the objects and then count the number of cases if we talk about a histogram here here it's a bar chart here it would be a histogram and if you have ratio scaled we have the absolute zero here at the beginning of our uh, coordinate system and we know that this va these values here are half the values here so from one to two this is just a ratio that's defined and here are again some examples nominal scaled you can define uh, equality or inequality and nothing more here for example with telephone numbers illnesses but also with ceramic types ordinal scaled we have a bigger smaller relationship like these things here but also stratigraphic relations for example are ordinal scaled uh, with interval scaled we can define that differences are the same so for calendar ages if something is uh, there is a difference between uh, 10 years it doesn't matter where on the absolute scale this takes place it is always the same difference and so we can compare differences here while with ratios we can compare ratios because we have an absolute zero point for example the height of a vessel uh, this is in ratio scale okay so having this aside and there was some some kind of repetition remember population and sample this is something that we now want to talk about and I said already in the beginning inductive statistics or statistical inference is a technique or a bunch of techniques to get some information about the population on the basis of a sample and since we never know how good our sample represents our population the results are always come always with a certain degree of uncertainty and that's also reflected in the way how the statistical tests report their results um, 
So the basis of statistical inference is probability theory or stochastics. So it is about having a probability set to something. We calculate a probability that a given statement is true or not based on the data that we have. Which results in the fact that all statements are true with a certain probability but could also be false with a certain probability. A statistical test actually doesn't prove anything to 100 degree. It just measures the amount of uncertainty that we are left with if we accept one statement or the other. Um, from a practical perspective, statistical hypothesis testing is one of the most relevant aspect of um, statistical inference. We make a hypothesis about our data and then we look on the basis of our sample how likely this statistical hypothesis is about the population. Um, so there are multiple ways of how a statistical hypothesis can be constructed or how the question that is related to this hypothesis can be arranged. For example, these are or these are very um, general, the two very general possibilities that we have here. How probable it is that two or more samples come from the same or a different underlying population. And with population, we have to think a bit wider here. A certain set of objects or things that are the output of a certain process. Not necessarily population of a country, but population in a sense that these objects in respect of our question belong to each other. We define some categories again here and see if um, two or more samples that we take might come from the same or a different population. For example, is the custom of grave goods in a burial ground for men and women so different that we have to think of them as two s different social groups in respect of how they are treated when they are buried. So there is a bit of abstraction going on here. The other version of that, and it's actually really just a version of that, is how probable it is that a given sample descends from a population with some certain parameters. So we define an abstract theoretical population and ask how likely it is that those data that we have could come from this specific population. Um, and it's probably not very obvious why this question is related to that. Is the amount of grave goods random or is there a pattern visible? Um, if the grave good is random, the, the, the amount of grave good per grave, then this is a specific population where the parameter of grave good number is random. Randomness is um, a specific way of wha what kind of population it can be, specific process that results in the production of these grave goods or in the uh, deposition of these grave goods. People just don't care what they give their disease and so this would hint towards a specific social strategy again. If we have a pattern then there is a different social strategy from the random strategy. How it is what kind of pattern is there might be subject to another test. But we can measure the probability that the grave goods are just random distributed among the burials and that would be a test against a specific population with certain parameters, randomness. So these are the two things. Either we compare two, p two samples, two or more samples with each other or we compare one sample with a specific population. So that's here a goodness of fit test. We see how good a po sample fits to a population that we parameterize. And that's here an independent test. We test uh, how independent these two samples are in respect to an underlying population. So these terms will probably show up some when and this is meant by that. How can we now test these things? And already with this example here, 
um, if there's a random pattern or is there a pattern visible here the question is um, how, we def how would we define that there is a pattern visible the it's very difficult to prove something with some kind of external evidence um, I could go now into philosophy of science here and explain that with some white and black swans but I will try to keep that very focused here so just saying that in these tests um, it's not um, tested if something is true but we are test the opposite and try to disprove that the opposite is possible the opposite of what we actually expecting is the so-called null hypothesis and we try to reject the null hypothesis we try to prove that the opposite of what we are thinking is not true and by that making its opposite our alternative hypothesis more plausible this null hypothesis is most of the time stated uh, that there is no association between different objects there is no difference between samples and the distribution of the object observations is by chance so non-interesting most of the time null hypothesis are rather uninteresting we state that there is no pattern visible and then we try to disprove this fact by showing that there is some kind of pattern and we don't have to specify what kind of pattern there is it is enough for this kind of test that we can show that there is any pattern and with that we can disprove our null hypothesis then we can for example go onward so in the example here the composition of grave goods is different between male and female our actual expectation or the interesting possibility would be that there is a difference there is a pattern visible we want to test that so we assume that the composition is the same and try to see how likely it is the same the same in respect to it is only subject to just random uh, change or random differences not pattern difference the reason is it is easier to prove that a statement is wrong to falsify it than to prove that it's true because in that case we would need to look at all the population to really verify that something is true if we falsify a different statement our sample might be enough because there's probably the one example that shows that the statement cannot be hold up but this also involves that if we cannot show that we have to keep the null hypothesis but we still don't know if there is not a hidden pattern that we just haven't seen and that's a big um, thing that we need to keep in mind when interpreting statistical tests if a statistical test is significant that means there is a pattern we learn something if a statistical test is not significant we do not know if the if there is a pattern in the data or not we probably just have simply too little data to prove that there is a pattern so in that case if we have a not significant result we do not learn anything new about the data set and also the second reason why we go this complicated way is that most of the time it's easier to formulate this null hypothesis uh, we don't have to think about how exactly the composition need to be different to prove something we just say that there is no pattern and then we test if there if we find any kind of pattern in the data or any association and then we can reject our hypothesis so one could now um, as I've said already um, ground that on on um, theory about uh, inference but we will just keep it like that here okay so from that the that the workflow for doing a statistical tests evolve and that's in the first place usually we have our alternative hypothesis we have an interesting question about our data and we want to test that so we say for example the composition of grave goods is different between male and female and it doesn't matter where we get this alternative hypothesis from probably we have already looked a bit on the data and we see that there seem to be a difference but we still don't know if this difference is big enough to um, not have resulted just from random chance in the selection of our data set so um, 
we need a way of testing that. So now we assume there is no pattern and all the differences that we see are just by random chance, by random selection from an underlying population. And that is our null hypothesis. The composition of the grave goods is the same for male and female burials. It's never exactly the same, but it's the same given that there might still be some random uh, structures going on here. Now we test that. We test, given that the population um, or that the composition of the grave goods is essentially the same and there's just a random selection pattern. And you can think about that like a simulation in a way. We simulate if there would be just random chance um, that influences the composition of the grave goods, how likely it is that this pattern that we are seeing in the data can emerge. You will see it's partly very, very easy to do that. Uh, you don't need to build up a computer simulation. Um, we can use some uh, established strategies here to get a feeling about that. And I've already mentioned the term significant and not significant. So this is what falls out of statistical test. And if the result of the test is significant, that means we can reject the null hypothesis and we can choose the alternative hypothesis. The patterning is so strong in the data that this is very unlikely to take place by chance. There's still a possibility that this could have taken by chance, but it's a very small possibility. And actually we are just measur measuring how likely it is that something can occur by chance. Um, if so, if the result is not significant, then the null hypothesis cannot be rejected. But this also doesn't mean that the null hypothesis essentially is true. We cannot just cannot say if the composition of the grave goods is different between male and female deceased, either because there is a very tiny difference or there's actually no difference at all, or we have just too little data to prove a pattern here. Again, I reiterate that a null hypothesis cannot be proven, it can only be rejected, and if so, we learn something, but if we cannot reject a null hypothesis, we don't learn anything new about the data set. We just shrug emoji here, we don't know more. Okay, significance, what is that? It's effectively a measure of um, possibility that something takes place by chance, if we have a pattern, or a measurement of how probable an error is if we reject the null hypothesis. So on the basis of the significance, the null hypothesis will be rejected, the alternative hypothesis will be chosen or not, based on an arbitrary value that we define about the security that we want to have if we choose the, the alternative hypothesis by rejecting the null hypothesis. So I said arbitrary chosen. There is a classical level here that's 0 0.05. That's a value that expresses we have only 5% probability that there is a random pattern that produces the pattern that we see in the data. So with 95% probability, the decision to reject a null hypothesis is right. There is a small chance left that what we see as pattern in the data is actually just the result of a random process. For archaeology, for a lot of sciences, this security is enough. 95% gives you an error 1 out of 20. And for most of the times, this is okay, this is acceptable, because um, we have a higher chance with this level to learn something new about the data. Remember, if we cannot reject a null hypothesis, we will not learn anything. If this is too strict, we never learn anything. But there are other sciences where you want to be more sure that something is correct. For example, if you have material sciences and you want to be sure that the bridge that you're building will hold, then you probably want to have more a higher probability that, for example, only one out of 100 bridges that you build will collapse after some cars drive over that. And in that case, you choose 0.01. It's also called very significant. And it has a 99% probability that the decision is right. 
if you choose the alternative hypothesis with the drawback that you can choose the alternative hypothesis less often than with the 0 0.05 probability. And if you're working in medicine and you're developing um, a drug or a uh, um, vaccination, you probably want to be much more sure that your uh, drug doesn't affect people negatively. Even taking into account that you probably will reject a drug that might be very useful but if there is a serious um, side effect of the drug you want to make sure that your company is not uh, um, yeah, put into legal problems be because of that and in such cases for example there is a 0 0.001 level that's highly significant and there's a 99.9 .9 percent probability that if you choose the alternative hypothesis you're on the right side. This significance level, this 0, 0.0 something, it's often called p-value or in German literature it's also called sometimes alpha but nowadays most of the time we talk about p-values and uh, you will see that in statistical tests in the literature uh, the p-value you want to have your p-value below 0 0.05 to have a significant result. Nevertheless, th there is no magic about this 0 0.05, that's just convention. People have agreed on that that is something um, on which they want to build science. Um, if this value is 0 0.06, um, it's only 1% more likely that rejecting the null hypothesis might be the wrong decision. So it's just convention. There is no magic about this value. But still, most of the time, you will look for 0 0.05 and a lot of scientific journals, for example, also look for the significance so that you have a significant result that people can work further with this uh, data. So there is some hype about that and some people try to push their probabilities, their, their significance with some tricks um, s uh, significance boosting or uh, sig uh, p-value hacking is that called um, there's a bit of danger of just talking about this specific value here. nevertheless for our for us and for our starting with stati our statistical career you aim for 0 0.05 keep that in mind okay now how can we get to these kind of p-values and for these we need the again these permit these statistical tests and they come in multiple flavors one big distinction is the distinction between parametric and non-parametric tests parametric tests are those that require your data to follow a certain distribution have a certain uh, level of measurement most of the time metric variables and quite often, um, for example, be normal distributed because that's the kind of distribution that's best understood. And it's a very common distribution. It results from a lot of small influences on the data. And if uh, so there is a lot of statistical tests that use the information about a specific distribution of the underlying data to have a clearer possibility to distinguish between um, significant and non-significant results and it's just the amount of information that goes into the test you can just forget about this level of measurements and the specific distribution you can think of norm parametric tests we get or assume more information about your data and with this extra information they can decide better between um, pattern or no pattern but in archaeology Quite often, we don't have this kind of data that follows this specific distribution, that has this, this additional information or has this level of measurement. And for those, we have non-parametric tests that don't have this, um, this necessity uh, and this uh, requirement for the data. Also, quite often, the sample sizes can be smaller. Um, so non-parameter tests um, are kind of you can throw 
your data in there and not have to have pretests to specify that your data follows a certain distribution. So they are much more safer. Quite often you can also use normal or ordinal scaled variables, which is most of the time not possible from parameter tests and which makes them very handy for archaeological purposes because quite often ordinal variables is the best that we can achieve with our data sets. Most of the time probably we just have nominal scaled variable and have to live with that and find appropriate tests for that. And in that case we have non-parameter tests and also for the most non-parameter tests uh, they require smaller sample sizes which is also something that we have to keep in mind for archaeology. The downside is because these tests work with lesser prior information they have a lesser power which means they can not so well identify a pattern if this is in the data. So quite often with these tests we will not be able to reject a null hypothesis where a parametric test that would be applicable in that situation would be able to do that. We have to live with that but these tests are very handy for our specific less information rich data that we have in archaeology. And one, I plugged that already before, one of the most versatile tests in this specific situation is the so-called chi-square test. And with this test you can answer already quite interesting archaeological questions like do settlements tend to be situated on rather good soil or is the distribution random? If we have indication about that we can draw a conclusion about settlement behavior and also the economy that govern this settlement because if people do not care for soil quality probably they also did not care so much about agricultural productivity and with that we can have further information about that. And Or the other way around, if there is a specific preference we know that the people actually cared and have an, had an understanding about the soil probability and were interested in, in um, increasing their productivity of their agricultural products. Or do older individuals have more shoeless cells, specific kind of eggs as grave goods in LBK than younger? So in that case, if older individuals have more, we have an information that you have uh, the status of um, your individuals is acquired with age. Age is, a, is an interesting factor here. And in that case, we can also have an idea about heredity or non-heredity of social ranks and social positions in a society. Quite an interesting question, I think, from an archaeological point of view. And for these kind of uh, things, we can use a chi-square test. And the big benefit is that is this test is possible for nominal scaled variables. Actually, we will measure in kind of an association between two nominal scaled variables and establish that if one variable has a specific value, for example, then the other val variable will likely also take a specific value. So we measure if there is an association between these two variables. Okay, and because we can use nominal data, it is specifically useful in archaeology because most of the time we have these kind of data. Um, I will skip that actually. I should have removed that from the presentation. So let's get back to the chi-square test. Um, and let's start and here I have some kind of sheet that gives you the, the basic structure of this test. So the chi-square test is a test f in general for the independence of two distributions. Like I've said before, independence in respect to the underlying population. Um, I are these two distributions likely to come from two different populations resulting from two different processes in the past or not? For the chi-square test we need at least one nominal scaled variable or if we compare two samples then we need another nominal scaled grouping variable that differentiates our samples and this can be for example if we compare different parts of the country in respect to the uh, um, level to the amount of settlement uh, versus grave versus horde for example grave hurt a horde and a settlement would be our first nominal scaled variable and if we have different parts of, of the country or so then this would be our 
second nominal scaled grouping variable part of the country. So this is uh, this identifies or distinguishes our different samples then in the end. So in the end, we most of the time need one nominal scaled variable. The procedure in the one sample case, if we have just one sample, we calculate there in that case most of the time we compare to a random situation where there is no influence on the sample. The observed values are computed with compared with expected values that we would expect given a specific distribution, for example a random distribution of a certain distribution here. And there is a prerequisite that no value should be no expected value should be below five and the total number of cases should be above 50. There are variants of this test that can also be applied if these pr uh, preconditions are not fulfilled, but we stick to the normal chic square test here. If we have two samples, um, so we don't compare to uh, expected values given a certain distribution, but we compare both distributions in respect to their expectation, expected values if the sample would be evenly distributed. Again, the same minimum requirements apply here. The test statistics that we use is called chi-square, that's why the whole thing is called chi-square test. And the significant that we can achieve, or the significant level, given a specific chi-square value, depends on something that's called degree of freedom. So let's digest this slide again a bit. So we need one nominal scaled variable, that's easy to achieve even in archaeology and probably we want to distinguish our samples in respect to another nominal scaled grouping variable. Either we compare our one sample to a specific distribution, you will see in practice what is meant by that and how this works out, or we compare two samples and assume that there is no difference between these two samples in respect to this actual nominal scaled variable and uh, we test how likely this is and that the small deviations only result from just random sample effects. It will be clearer probably when we come to the example but first let's talk about, about this degree of freedom. That's something that's not so difficult to understand and probably it takes you off to the stuff that comes later on. Degree of freedom can be different things in statistics. Here it means how many elements are we free to choose before all the other elements are defined. For example, we have here a classical 2x2 two two category um, situation. That's quite often uh, something that is uh, measured with a chi-square test. We have male and female burials and we have cremation and inhumation. And we know how many male and female burials there were and we know how many total cremation and inhumation there were and we know the total number of graves here. How many of these inner cells we need to fill in before we can calculate all the other cells? And usually I'll uh, just let the people guess here but the answer is one. If we have just fixed one of these inner cells and it doesn't matter which one, all the others can be calculated from that because we know how many total male burials we have if we have the cremation burial, we can calculate how many inhumation burials are left. Also, if we know how many um, burials were male with the cremation burials, we know how many total cremation burials were there, we can calculate the female burials. And with that, we can calculate the whole table here. In that case, we have a degree of freedom. We can choose one of the cells freely of one. So after we have chosen one, all the rest is defined. And if we look at these kind of tables, the degree of freedom is easy to calculate because we just have to take the number of columns, two, subtract one, and the number of rows, two, subtract one, multiply both, and then we have the degree of freedom of one. One times one equals to one, so degree of freedom of one. If we have a more complicated situation where we have three categories here, if we fill in one of the values here, we can calculate how many inhumation, female inhumation we have. But we cannot distribute this 201 total cremation between male and uncertain 
because we don't know how these values are fixed. So if we fill in one, the whole table is not defined yet. Um, we need to fill in two values here. So two with two values, sorry, was too fast. We can calculate this, we can calculate that, that, and then we can calculate the whole table. So we have degree of freedom of two. Again, we can also calculate that we have three columns, minus one is two, times two rows, minus one is one, two times one is two, degree of freedom of two. Now, if we have even more um, rows here, now if we, we need to fill in four tables before we can calculate all the rest, and it doesn't matter which of those we fill in, we will always be able to calculate the rest of the table if we have four uh, cells filled here. So with that we have an idea about a degree of freedom and actually it's probably not so relevant if you use statistical software but you will see when we do that totally by hand and that's what I want to do with you you need to have an idea about the degree of freedom because you compare your calculated level of surprise, which is actually the chi-square value, with a maximum level of surprise that you would expect for a random situation. And this depends on how big the degrees of freedom are in your table, how much variability is acceptable before everything is fixed. So let's turn to an uh, example here to put some numbers behind that and probably also some understanding about some concepts I have talked about before uh, for your brains. So this example is taken from the Stephen Shannon book Quantifying Archaeology, like some other examples also. And we have here the number of Neolithic settlements by soil type in Eastern France. So we have different soil types and this reflects to the initial question I've asked before. Uh, we have different number of settlements here. And currently we just treat these soil types as just some um, yeah, nominal characters, nominal uh, categories. We don't know which soil type is actually better, but we want to see if there's a pattern in respect of the number of settlements there. And it seems that Redzina, Redzina takes most of the settlements, so it probably is the preferred uh, soil type for a settlement, but currently we don't know if this is just a sampling effect how likely if we just draw random samples out of a bag of uh, uh, different soil types, how likely it is that we would end up with this kind of number here just by drawing randomly and there's no pattern in the underlying uh, values here. So is there a significant preference for soil type? <coughs> and we can calculate two versions. Either we assume that the soil types are evenly distributed over the whole landscape, like it is now, like this uh, table uh, um, assumes. But if we have um, more information about the distribution of the soil types, we can change our uh, proportion of the soil types on the total area, or we don't change that, we'll consider that to change our expectation of distribution. Our expectation, in respect of expectation values, were already mentioned. This is the something against which we compare our actual settlements and see how much surprised we are about the actual um, distribution of the numbers here. Okay, let's assume our different soil types are evenly distributed over the whole research area. In that case, we would assume that every soil type is takes up one third of the total area of our um, investigation area. So each soil type would have one third of the total area. And if we would expect a totally random pattern here, or, in, an, or if the, the most likely value, sorry for jumping a bit between the different wordings here, would be that um, we would expect a third of the total number of, of settlements be on one soil, for all the different soil types. If one third of the area is of the specific soil type, if there is no pattern at all, 
on each solid tab there should be one third of the total number here which in that case is dividing total number by one third and we would get an expectation value of 17.6 settlements per soil type here. Now we can already compare the actual number and see that 26 is much higher than our 17 while the 9 is much lower than our 17. And now the, dis the distinction between or the difference between the actual number and the expected number here is already kind of a measurement of our surprise. We are more surprised about the number at Retzina than on Brown Earth because that's very close to our expected number of settlements here. But we want to have that in a statistical uh, way that also includes um, um, probability theory and so we make a proper test here. At first we assume what like we see from the data or like we assume from the data that the settlement are not evenly distributed in all soil types. That's our alternative hypothesis. Based on that we build up our null hypothesis and our null hypothesis is this is evenly distributed in all the soil types which is represented here by our expected values. This is our null hypothesis and we test how likely these numbers can come from this kind of distribution. For that we calculate our real measurement of su surprise and that's the chi square. So we have to um, normalize our difference here. As I said already, the dis difference between the actual observed number and the expected number, that's our essential element of surprise. But since we do not care for being surprised if this is higher or lesser than the expected value, we have to get rid of the sign here for the um, for the difference. So if I subtract this 17 from 26, I get a positive value. If I subtract this 17 from the 9, I get a net negative value. But when we only want to see if there's a pattern, we just want to measure if we are surprised, to what degree we are surprised or not, no matter in which direction. A mathematical trick to remove the sign here is to make a, a square to square the result here. So we subtract from the observed the expected values and square that and with that we get rid of the sign but we now we have a squared value which is much higher than our original value and to scale that down again to the absolute number or the absolute number range that we are in we divide again by the expected value to get a more reasonable measurement of surprise for our actual number of cases because imagine the same difference here would be not so surprising if this would have more zeros if there's uh, for example um, 260 and um, okay it's difficult to construct here but if we have more cases then a difference here of uh, what is that nine or so would be not so surprising for this individual row here um, then it is in that case so if we are quite surprised by this large difference here if this is 260 and this was uh, um, yeah 259 uh, 51 then our um, surprise would not be so large so that's why we have to scale that to the absolute actually expected values here we use the expected values because we want to be independent from whatever um, specific value comes from our observation. And that's the whole uh, formula for calculating chi square. We're taking our observed, subtracting the expected, divide our uh, um, square that and divide it again by the expected and that is the measurement of chi square. We can do that for all the different rows in our table here. We have 26 observed cases for Encina, we have expected 17.6 there's a difference of 8.3 if we square that we get to 69 and if we divide it again by the expected values we get to 3.9 here the same for alluvial and here the difference is a bit higher it's negative but it, we don't care we remove that by squaring that and so our 
measure of surprise is higher for alluvial than for the Rencina. And for the brown earth, we are not very surprised here. So this expected value gets, or this, this surprise element gets very, very low here. So this is in uh, very likely to uh, be compatible with our null hypothesis, while the others, we are very surprised about that. And if we now calculate the total number, the total measure of surprise of about this whole data set, we have the total chi square value here, which is 8.1. Without a computer, we need to look this up in a table, for example, at Stephen Shannon. I uh, will provide you with some tables where you can look that up. And there we need the degrees of freedom. So we have here degree of freedom of two, because we have two columns, expected and observed, and three categories, Francina, Alluvial and Brown Earth. If we look that up for a significance level of 0 0.05, that's what we would like to have, there is a boundary value given. That's the maximum amount of surprise, maximum chi square value, that still would fit with the null hypothesis. That's just random chance that we see here. Our element of surprise is higher. So we can say that it's a significant result. The distribution is uneven. First statistical test done. Just calculating the number, look in the table, have a specific level of significance in mind and know your degrees of freedom and then compare and if this is higher there is a significant result. We don't see any p-values here, that's okay. Here we just say significant or not. Okay, let's speed this a bit up. Imagine now that we have um, different proportion of the soil types on the total area of uh, our investigation area. In that case, it differs. So in this case, that it differs not too much, but alluvial is a bit underrepresented in total area, while brown earth is really takes nearly one third of the total area here. If we have this additional information, that doesn't change anything about our actual values, but it changes our expectation numbers. But because now we are not assuming that all the values, our expectation is not all the values are equal one third, but now we can use this proportion here. This is our um, distribution, and we compare the situation that the distribution of the different soil types on the area is the same, comes from the same process, random process, like the distribution of the settlements on these specific soil types, meaning they are just randomly distributed over a portion of uh, the area which just have different soil types. So with that, we get different expected number of settlements, taking into account a different proportion of the soil types on the total area. And with that, the rest is like we had before. N we compare again our number of observed cases with our now different number of expected cases, calculate the difference, square that to get rid of the, of the sign, and then divide it again by our expectation uh, by our expected values, and you can see that there's a difference here. Uh, Alluvial is not so m surprising as it was before, because we have higher number of expected cases here, or actually a lower number of expected cases in respect to the original distribution, and so we get a smaller uh, total chi square value, but still the same. The rest. Uh, is the same. We still have two degrees of freedom. We still aim for 0 0.05 significance level and the boundary value for, for this reason is still the same, 5.9, so nearly 6. Our value is still higher than this boundary value, so still we have a significant result even if uh, we consider the different proportions of the soil types on the area. With that you have already quite a tool set to answer questions about the random or not random distribution of different objects given different categories and different possibly distribution of these categories. Now there is the second version of this test and that's comparing two samples or it's actually the same like comparing the relationship between two variables and here I have again a classical two by two situation. We have 
different sides of early Bronze Age. Some of them have amber, these. Some of them do not have amber. Presence and absence of amber is the variable here on the, the column level. On the row level, we have the type of sites. We have some settlements and we have some graves. And now we test whether the occurrence of amber is independent from the site type. Of course, you could turn that around and say um, that um, the site type is independent from amber, but amber will not cause uh, a, a site type to be take a specific type. W our causality rather goes in the direction if we have a settlement, probably the deposition, deposition dip, uh, processes are different from graves, and this could result in amber being more associated with settlements than with graves. We can see here that there's a large difference in total numbers. So it's already difficult to see if there is a pattern here visible or not. Of course, you can uh, um, calculate percentages here and then you would see the pattern a bit clearer. But the level, sti uh, the, the question is still, is this, is Ember primary a good? And is this significantly significant with, again, a level of significance of 0.05? In this 2x2 two two case, we have a degree of freedom of 1. Remember, two columns, uh, two columns, two rows, uh, gives a degree of freedom of 1. Okay, what do we do now? We need still to calculate expected values. And this, this is a bit tricky to, to follow and to understand, but I'm optimistic that you will be able to do that. If uh, the presence of amber would be independent from um from a settlement or not uh, of if the distribution of amber in settlements presence or absence is independent from that this is a settlement the distribution inside of the settlements would be the same as the distribution of the total sites in respect of amber or not amber so if we have 200 total sites 138 have amber 62 have no amber in the settlement the same ratio should be like in the total sites of amber versus not amber and the same is true for the graves the only thing is that we have some fixed numbers here in the margins of the table we know that we have 24 settlements we know that we have 176 burials so we have to take that into account to calculate the percentage uh, distribution here or the distribution of the total 200 sites here in our tables. So in the settlement it should have the same amount of sites with amber than in the total compared to the 200 total sites here by settlements in respect to the 24 total settlement sites that we have. The same percentage uh, of settlements with amber without amber like with the total size. I did that, I said that on several times in different ways to spell that. I hope that helps you to understand what the idea behind that is. Now to calculate our expected values, we multiply the total, the number of total settlement sites to the ratio of total sites with amber. We have totally 200 sites, we have 138 total sites with amber and we divide our sites with amber by the total number of sites to get the ratio of sites with amber and then we multiply that by the 24 actual settlement sites that we have and with that we get 16 sites 16.5 sites settlement sites that should have amber if there is a random distribution the same is true here for the sites without amber. We have 62 sites without amber. We divide that by 200 to get the ratio of si total ratio of sites without amber. And then we multiply that by the 24 settlement sites that we have. And this gives us 7.4 sites should have amber. The same is true then for the grave row here. And again, now we have our expected values, we have already our observed values, and now we can calculate a chi-square value for each individual table here, for each individual cell here. So we just plug in the numbers, 6 observed minus 16.56 6 
uh, expected to the square divided by the uh, 16.56 again to get a chi square value the element of surprise for this specific cell and we do that for all the cells here and when we do that this is what takes place here in the inner part of the cells we get to uh, 6.73 and 14.99 for our settlements and 0 0.92 and 2.04 for our graves and this gives a total of because we have very surprisingly little settlements with um, without amber that gives us a significance value of 24.6 if we just add all the individual chi square values of the cells together the boundary value in the table for degree of freedom of 1 and 0 0.05 probability um, p-value is 3 and our 24 is much higher than this 3 so we have a significant uh, pattern in the data here the difference in distribution is significantly not by chance both variables are associated with 95% probability that this statement is correct okay so much for what is done in a chi-square test on a theoretical basis and uh, in a practical video you will see how you can do this chi-square test yourself in LibreOffice Calc it's just one of the many possible statistical tests that you can do, but it's a very basic one. It's easy to understand, rather easy to understand what is going on there. And the logic, I hope you can could follow the basic logic of that. And uh, you can do that in LibreOffice Calc. More educated um, tests for that, you need st specific statistical software. Okay. For the rest, um, you can always contact me via the email or in the Slack channel and you find likely, you know that, uh, the presentation on the uh, course website. Um, so looking forward seeing you in presence in a few days and yeah, there we will try that out together and make this work and make your first probably your first statistical test running and see what kind of results you get out of that.